to uh, the second uh, in our classics lecture series. Um, so, uh, please join me in welcoming Brooke Holmes, our Princeton University, uh, to speak to us again um, in this in her series, The Tissue of the World: Sympathy in Ancient Greco-Roman Thought. Uh, the title of tonight's lecture is Networks of Affinity and Hostility. Great. Well, it's really a pleasure to be back um, here speaking to you today in the second installment uh, of the lecture series. So in 1934, the Estonian biologist Jakob von Uxkul published his post-humanist classic, A Foray into the World of Animals and Humans. Now, the book famously begins with a fragment of modern-day pastoral idyll, so a country dweller tramping through the woods with his dog. Almost immediately, the idyll is interrupted by an unwelcome intrusion, the tick. We're given a brief sketch of the insect, and then von Uxkul begins to subtly refocalize the country dweller's walk through the eyes of the tick, or more accurately, through its sense of smell. So the eyeless creature finds its way to its lookout with the help of a general sensitivity to light in the skin. The blind and deaf bandit becomes aware of the approach of its prey through the sense of smell. The odor of butyric acid, which is given off by the skin glands of all mammals, gives the tick the signal to leave its watch post and leap off. If it then falls onto something warm, which its fine sense of temperature will tell it, then it has reached its prey, the warm-blooded animal, and needs only use its sense of touch to find a spot as free of hair as possible in order to bore past its own head into the skin tissue of the prey. Now the tick pumps a stream of warm blood slowly into itself. So after its feast, the tick falls to the ground, lays its eggs, because the predator here is female, and dies. So the tick's last leap is von Ixkul's introduction to a central concept of the foray, namely the umwelt, which we can clunkily translate as perceptual life world. And we enter that world not by smell, but by a strategy of focalization designed to transport us out of our own life worlds into that of the tick. And this displacement drives home a polemical point. From the first chapter of the foray, von Uxkul pits himself against someone he calls the physiologist, who sees animals as mere machines with no subjective presence. By contrast, von Uxkul insists that all animals are machine operators engaged in semiotic activity. So what sets the tick in motion is the scent of butyric acid. That sign triggers a response, in this case, a collision with the mammal. Once the tick meets its target, it's positioned to perceive yet another stimulus, so the flesh in its hairiness or its hairlessness, and so on and so forth. So everything comes down to the animal's attunement to its environment. All animal subjects, von Ixkul writes, from the simplest to the most complex, are inserted into their environments with the same degree of perfection. The simple animal has a simple environment. The multiform animal has a multiform environment. So what does it mean that an animal is inserted into its environment? It's well known that intentionalist language has haunted evolutionary biology from Lucretius to Darwin. But von Uxkul does not shy away from this language. His, rather, is a biology unabashed in its commitment to nature as machine operator itself or herself. He attacks Darwinism for failing to account for the purposefulness of life, but also the ways in which life forms are entwined contrapuntally. He describes such contrapuntalism lovingly and at length as nature's symphony, and sometimes in rather ominous terms, for he's writing in 1930s Germany, as the master plan. That von Uxkel is committed both to mindful capital N, nature, and the umwelt of the tick has led the critic Dorian Sagan to describe him as divided. We might say that von Uxkul seems to move along two axes at once, one running at ground level through the life worlds of worms and ticks, the other oriented vertically along the capital N of nature. The dividedness of von Uxkul's vision makes it, I suggest, neo-sympathetic. And at the very least, the foray vividly returns us to the domain of sympathy that I began to map last week in my lecture on sympathy in the Stoics. 
Much like von Uxkull, the Stoics, as we saw, are committed to the perfect order of the cosmos, its unity and its completeness. And one of their privileged sites for demonstrating this unity was pointing to the manifold instances of sympathy in the natural world, from lunar influences on the growth cycles of shellfish to seasonal flowering. God is at work on a grand scale, but God is also at work in the details. The imminence of divine mind means that any part of the macrocosm can be taken as an entry point to grasping the macrocosm as a whole. If sympathy invites us to imagine the cosmos as a closed system, it also encourages us, encourages us to dwell in the openness of living bodies to one another. So last week, I elaborated the doubleness of Stoic sympathy in precisely these terms, in terms of openness and closedness. And I argued that a twofold perspective can help us see how Stoic physics and metaphysics engage with the complexity of organic life. It's well known that the Stoics were committed to the idea that the cosmos is alive, sentient, and intelligent. Now, that idea is not supported directly from arguments uh, for sympathy, as we saw. Nevertheless, the living body is a privileged site for expressing sympathy as a phenomenon proper to unified bodies. And what this means, I argued, is that sympathy becomes a mode through which Stoic cosmology is haunted by the complexities of organicism. More specifically, sympathy draws out these complexities by exaggerating a body's participation in the passive principle, that is, its affectability, as well as its organization under the direction of the active principle mind or nature or God. The paradigmatic case of the passive principle is the cut finger that communicates its pain to the entire body. Now technically that case transfers imperfectly to the macrocosmic level. The cosmos qua animal is wholly self-sufficient and so impervious to pain. Yet I suggested we should be wary of enforcing too strict a boundary between the macrocosm and the microcosm. For it's important to recognize how stoic sympathy doesn't just analogically extend the organism to the macrocosmic level. Rather, by embedding individual bodies in a cosmic web, it renegotiates the boundaries of the organism. The very difficulty of imagining a self-sufficient organism suggests that the sympathetically enmeshed body works metonymically in order to project a cosmos marked by openness and affectability. But on the other hand, sympathy between parts can point to the kind of structured organization necessary for life as the end goal, that is the telos of an organism. The significance of structure grows as we zoom out to the dimensions of the cosmic animal. So what kind of end goal can we imagine for the cosmos? Sympathy subtly encourages questions about the purpose served by individual parts. It's hardly an accident then that sympathy is a crucial feature of the stoic concept of fate. Through fate, the life of the cosmos becomes coextensive with a master plan or a net of causes bound together by sympathy. The more that we think about sympathy in terms of top-down organization, the more another dynamic opens up in its domain, a dynamic between the macrocosm and the microcosms that populate it. For of course, microcosms are not just parts of a whole. They're also wholes in their own right, enmeshed in sympathetic networks that support the perpetuation of life on a micro scale. So what is the relationship of these holes to the master hole? In my lecture today, I want to take up this question by exploring sympathy as a pivot between natures in the plural and nature singular as a unifying force. Now you may have noticed that in my talk last week, I used the term nature interchangeably with other synonyms of the Stoics active principle, including God and mind and fate. And in so doing, I was following the practice of the sources themselves. But today, I want to home in on nature a bit more specifically. I do so in part by asking how the attention to sympathy is the relation between nature, so what I'm going to call terrestrial sympathy, can encourage the imagination of a supra-individual organizing principle called nature. My main text for doing this is going to be Pliny's Natural History. The focus on capital N, nature, brings with it, we'll see, questions about how nature is expressed and enacted through the manifold natures that inhabit the cosmos. 
So I want to explore the juncture between macrocosm and microcosm by focusing first on the phenomenon of oikiosis in the Stoics, where I argue that we can trace what I'll be calling a fold between nature singular and nature's plural. I then take up this fold from another angle by briefly considering the concept of the vegetal body and the plant itself in Galen. Today, then, I focus on earthly natures bound not just to a larger whole, but to one another. For one of the important consequences of the shift to terrestrial sympathy is that the part-to-whole relationship recedes, and the part-to-part relationship comes to the foreground. From the vantage point of cosmic sympathy, the part-to-part -part relationship turns primarily on shared responsiveness to um, modulations in an active principle via pneuma, so coordinated season seasonal changes, for example, or correspondences, again, between the growth of the moon and the growth of living things. In On Divination, Cicero describes these sympathies as bearing witness to some kind of kinship, cognatio, uh, in the nature of things. And indeed, to the extent that all parts are recuperated by the organic wholeness of the cosmos, a commitment to universal kinship seems like a natural corollary of cosmic sympathy. But even in the context of cosmic sympathy, kinship can also be understood in a more restricted way. Marcus Aurelius begins one of his meditations with the statement that, quote, and this is number one on the handout, all things that participate in something common to them all move towards what is of the same kind as themselves. Now, the axiom is at one level just a version of the hoary principle like to like. But in Marcus's hands, it leads to a hierarchy of erotic and social associations, from elemental attractions to swarms of bees to human friendships and contracts, and eventually, at the highest level, to astral sympathies. But once affinity has been narrowed in this way, we're faced with the question of what governs the relationships that don't fall under sympathy's power. So one answer is nothing at all. The opposite of the relation is indifference. Another possibility is that affinity and kinship can be answered by hostility and foreignness, that is, by antipathy. So even a cursory review, cursory review of sympathy across the corpus of post-classical literature will show that it is very often partnered with antipathy. The pairing of sympathy with antipathy gives sympathy a different valence. The Stoics work primarily with what I call solo sympathy. That is, they see any form of co-affection as sympathy without regard to whether the result is productive or beneficial or damaging. In Cicero, for example, when Balbus discusses the antipathy between the vine and the cabbage, it's part of a longer excursus on the providential foresight of nature. For the Stoics, then, the aim is to recuperate parts into a whole, and so the prefix soon in sympathia is unifying. By contrast, when sympathy is partnered with antipathy, the soon prefix designates affinity or appropriateness against the foil of the anti in antipathy. So this is love versus war, and an echo of the Empedoclean uh, uh, difference between love and strife. So for example, Pliny opens book 20 of his natural history, and this is number two on your handout, by declaring that he plans to speak of, quote, the internal peace and war of nature, the hatreds and friendships of mute and insensate objects, what the Greeks call sympathy and antipathy. In material from Bolus of Mendes uh, or Pseudo Democritus, we find the programmatic statement, number three on your handout, nature delights in nature and nature conquers nature and nature masters nature. The statement tellingly recurs in fragments ascribed to other figures associated with the traditions of learned magic and alchemy. In these contexts, nature is divided as much as it is united by mutual affectability. So these references to Pliny and Bolus underscore the fact that with the arrival of antipathy comes a shift in genre and intellectual tradition, away from cosmology and metaphysics toward natural history and learned magic. Now, for some scholars, the differences are sufficiently great to see not one, but two sympathies, each to be treated separately, each in its own milieu. But as I hope to show today and also next week, these various sympathies converge as aspects of the same elastic and, dare I say, organic conceptual habit. So this is not to say that genre does not matter, but it matters, I think, because it shapes what sympathy makes possible. 
For the Stoics, sympathy is a springboard to claims made about the cosmos or about God. By contrast, texts that are aimed at cataloging sympathies and antipathies in the world often have more pragmatic ends. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't also have large metaphysical stakes. But there's a strong emphasis on the fact that one who knows the sympathies and antipathies that structure the world um, can manipulate nature. So Pliny introduces sympathy and antipathy at the beginning of his books on Materia Medica, so books 20 to 32, as the basis of the whole system. In the first or second century CE astrobotanical text that's ascribed to Thessalus, the secret that the author uncovers with great fanfare concerns precisely the use of sympathies and antipathies in stones and plants for medicinal ends. And in Plotinus as well, sympathy again figures prominently as a site for the manipulation of nature through magic. And even if we fast forwarded to say someone like Para, Paracelsus um, in the 16th century, again, sympathy and antipathy is being used for pragmatic therapeutic purposes. Now, I'm not uninterested in the pragmatics of sympathy and antipathy. But what I'm primarily interested in today is how a terrain that's organized by relations of sympathy and antipathy becomes a place to consider how the natures of animals and plants are shaped by their participation in cross-species communities. So I focus on those moments where the observation of sympathies and antipathies, whether or not they're explicitly identified as such, provokes questions, again, however fleeting and apparetic, about what makes these relationships possible. So consider for a moment a brief interruption in Balbus's uh, catalog of examples intended to demonstrate nature's providential design of flora and fauna in Cicero's On Nature of Gods. So this is number four in your handout. He's reached the pinna and the pinna guard, two very different marine creatures, so um, a kind of bivalve ma uh, mollusk and a kind of shrimp that cooperate in order to catch prey. And here Balbus pauses in his catalog of factoids to wonder whether the symbiosis of the pinna and the pinna guard is due to a mutual compact or whether it was orchestrated by nature herself at the moment of each creature's birth. So we're given disjunctive alternatives here, but I think that the truth may actually be somewhere in between. For one of the questions that sympathy puts on the table is how nature's, are, nature's intentions are realized through something like the mind of the pinna, as well as through the contrapuntal encounter between pinna mind and pinna guard mind. There's been a perennial interest in the scholarship and the question of how to reconcile the stoic net of causes with questions of human freedom. We might pose the question another way, though. How is the master map of sympathies and antipathies realized from within the perceptual life worlds of non-human natures? And at the same time, how do the explanatory limitations of those life worlds encourage Greco-Roman writers to imagine a unified nature organizing the lives of organisms through relationships of interdependence? So I want to now get a start on these questions by turning to Pliny's natural history. So Pliny, as we've seen, makes sympathy and antipathy the centerpiece of his books on medicinal knowledge. These forces organize the whole system, as we saw at the start of Book 20, and in the preface on Book 24 on trees and what Pliny calls the wilder face of nature, Pliny again invokes sympathies and antipathies as absolutely central to his project. Now, sympathy, uh, now, Pliny allows sympathy and antipathy a scope that is at once cosmic and elemental. So the sun absorbs water, for example, while the moon gives birth to it. But his gaze comes to rest on what I've been calling terrestrial sympathies and antipathies, the inveterate hatred that divides the oak from the olive tree or the uh, blood of a goat that can break the strength of a diamond. What Pliny puts front and center is a cross-species community where loves and hate enmesh even non-sentient beings, so sensu carentia. Now, this idea of loves and hates among animals and plants is one that can be traced back to the earliest writers in the natural history tradition, uh, Aristotle and Theophrastus. So Aristotle's Historia Animalium abounds in examples of the friendships and wars, that is the philiae and the polemoi, among animals that usually involve reciprocal benefit or the competition for resources. So the snake is at war with the weasel and the pig, for example, but the raven and the fox are friends. 
in Theophrastus's writings on plants, different species will collaborate, sooner or gay, to preserve each other. But of course, they can also be antipathetic to each other, as the cabbage and the bay are to the vine. But while Aristotle and Theophrastus are important sources for later work on sympathies and antipathies, neither of them describes non-human friendships and hatreds in terms of sympathy and antipathy. Such language seems to have become common only in the Hellenistic period, perhaps through the occult study of what Pliny calls the more marvelous communities in nature. And one clue here is that, as Patricia Gaillard Su has pointed out, the source that Pliny cites the most often in his natural history is Democritus, by whom he presumably means Bolus of Mendes, again, who published as Pseudo Democritus. Now, Pliny's aim in the medical books is self consciously pragmatic. He laments that his fellow human beings are ignorant of the means of life, and he writes precisely in order to combat that ignorance. The discourse on utility means that Pliny is usually more interested in mapping out a network of sympathies and antipathies for the reader than he is in actually explaining how those relationships work. Nevertheless, he's at least on one occasion urged to productive puzzlement about the players involved in sympathy and antipathy. Before turning to the passage in question, though, let's take a closer look at how Pliny locates animals within sympathetic and antipathetic networks. So first, animals are embedded as primary participants in relationships of sympathy and antipathy together with plants and stones. So if, for example, you throw something translated as goat lettuce into the sea, it will kill all of the uh, fish in the vicinity. Bees, for example, are very fond of mustard blossoms, etc., etc. Now, the relation here is established at the level of the species. It often operates unproblematically as unthought and given. So if a bee will avoid an olive tree, that behavior seems to be as necessary and, as it were, as unwilled as when a flea drops dead at the scent of, of pennyroyal. So there's no difference here marked between what looks like self-willed movement and the direct effect of another nature on the nature in question, so action and reaction. Nevertheless, the language of friendships and wars, love and hate, limbs a richer notion of social agency and non-human mind. The promise of that language is brought out more clearly if we turn to the second way in which animals participate in relationships of sympathy and antipathy. For as it turns out, animals are themselves capable of manipulating sympathies and antipathies for their own benefit. In this capacity, in fact, they become valuable models for the human researcher who is studying affinities and hostilities. The legendary Melampus, for example, is said to have used hellbore to cure the madness of the daughters of Proteus after observing that his she-goats were purged after eating it. Indeed, Pliny observes that animals do as much good for the discovery of medicines as they do uh, by supplying these medicines via their own natures. So Pliny was not the first to observe the marvelous phenomenon of animals exercising therapeutic and prophylactic intuitions. So Aristotle is already reporting, again in the Historia Animalium, that Cretan goats stuck by, struck by arrows will seek out the herb dittany in order to make those arrows fall out. By the first century CE, such stories were circulating as part of a common repertoire of wonders, and as such, they could function as simply interesting factoids. But they also held implications for thinking about non-human minds. This is most, um, these implications are especially explicit in Plutarch's dialogue commonly known as the Gryllus. The star of that dialogue is one of Circe's pigs. His aim is to disabuse Odysseus of the assumption that the enchanted swine would prefer to return to human form. And one of his central arguments concerns precisely the medical gifts of non-human animals. So he says, each is his own specialist in medicine. He proceeds to give a full list of examples, so pigs that go to the river and catch crabs when they're sick, tortoises that eat marjoram after swallowing snakes, and of course, the Cretan goats who seek out dittany if they're struck by arrows. So how can we explain such intuitions? And Gryllus has an answer, and this is number five on your handout. He says, for if you speak the truth and say that nature is the teacher, you are elevating the intelligence of animals to the most sovereign and the wisest of first principles. If you do not think that it should be called reason or intelligence, it's high time for you to cast about for some fairer and more, uh, an even more honorable term to describe it, since certainly the faculty that it brings to bear on action is better and more remarkable. Now, the pig here is taking the side of animals in a competitive interspecies game. That's the premise of the dialogue. 
And the real target of the attack is probably not Odysseus, but the Stoics who systematically denied reason to animals. If merely instinctual action wasn't going to be taken as a threat to the prerogative of reason, Gryllus uses intui intuitive therapeutic knowledge in order to raise the stakes of the debate. So he concludes that whatever you want to call the animal intelligence behind such knowledge, it trumps human reason. Now, these larger philosophical questions are rather out of place in the natural history, and it seems a stretch to call Pliny a proponent of what Lovejoy and Boas label animal animalitarianism. But Pliny is full of examples of animals capable of caring for and healing themselves. In some cases, animals gravitate toward plants that are beneficial to them. For example, snakes will use fennel in order to aid in casting off their old skins and to improve their eyesight. In other cases, animals use plants or other natural substances as a prophylaxis against antipathies that they expect to encounter. So, for example, Pliny tells us that weasels going into battle against snakes will first fortify themselves with the plant rue. Here we see that animals grasp, grasp not just what's beneficial to themselves, but what is harmful to their enemies. In a similar way, animals are said to use herbal remedies to heal injuries. So the swallow, for example, will seek out Caledonia in order to heal wounds to its eyes. Now beneath these observations, a subtle contrast is at work. Human beings arrive at conclusions about benefit and harm by making rational inferences in part on the, uh, on the basis of the observation of animals. By contrast, non-human animals act on knowledge about harm and benefit intuitively. And yet, on close examination, the knowledge in question turns out to be pretty complex. If a bee avoids an olive blossom or a snake seeks out fennel, we can describe these behaviors as somehow internal to relationships of sympathy and antipathy. And by that, I mean that the nature of the animal is one node in an antipathetic or sympathetic nexus. But in the case of animals who are seeking out, uh, say, prophylactic remedies or uh, antidotes, the situation is triangulated. So the animals are continuing to pursue self-preservation, but they do so by acting on a knowledge of natural antipathies between, say, rue and snake venom to protect or to heal themselves. So Gryllus calls such knowledge more remarkable than rational intelligence, and he credits it to the teachings of nature. Pliny turns, uh, tends to be more circumspect about animals' therapeutic intuitions. One case, however, shows him struggling to account for the non-rational nature of this knowledge. So early on in Book 27, Pliny mentions the fast-acting poison aconite and notes that it's especially toxic to leopards. He reports that people in areas with an overpopulation of leopards actually take advantage of this natural antipathy between leopards and aconite in order to manage the population of the wild felines by rubbing meat with the poison and setting it out for the animals. And the leopards usually fall for the trick, but they also have a remedy. If they eat human excrement, they will recover. How do they know how to do this? Pliny ends up with the following rather muddled conclusion, and this is number six on the handout. So who would doubt that the remedy has been discovered by chance and that as often as it occurs, it is even now discovered as new, since reason and use do not allow wild animals to transmit it amongst themselves. Therefore, this chance, this is that God who discovers the majority of things in life. This is the name by which is meant she who is the parent of all things and their master. Now, either conjecture is likely whether we determine that wild animals discover these things daily or whether they always know. Now, Pliny rejects the idea that leopards learn from experience or that they learn from one another, and he does so on the grounds that leopards, like all non-human animals, lack the faculty, namely reason, that's needed to acquire knowledge and transmit it amongst themselves. And in this, Pliny is not alone. So Elian, too, in reporting the same story, stresses that the leopard cures itself unknowingly. In Pliny's case, he concludes that the animals happen across the remedy in question by chance. Yet it's hard to believe that every time a leopard cures itself in this way, it is simply a lucky coincidence. And Pliny himself seems to sense that the explanation is not entirely adequate and abruptly shifts into a paean to chance as a god who is immediately recast as the mother and the mistress of all things, that is, as nature. By recasting haphazardness as nature's guiding hand, Pliny minimizes the difference between the two explanations that he ends up with. Either leopards make the same discovery every day or else they always know some obscurity. 
It's worth recalling here how Balbus uh, wonders whether the relationship between the pinna and the pinnagard is due to a mutual compact or whether it is given at birth. In Pliny, the leopard can't learn the behavior involved, and so the question comes down to whether nature governs the process of discovery or whether nature works through the animal as a form of knowledge or quasi-knowledge. Now, Pliny takes the difference between these options to be minimal. As Roger French has pointed out, nature is both an individual and a trans-individual agency in Pliny, and that is true more generally, not just for natura in Latin, but for phusis in Greek. But rather than take that ambiguity for granted, I think it's worth taking a closer look at the way that Pliny tries to account for our scatophagic leopard. So first, let's think a little bit about the problem that's being posed here. The leopard seems to have an understanding of not just what's beneficial to him, say, as food, but also as medicine, which is to say he grasps an antipathy out there in the world, again, albeit for his own benefit. The knowledge or the quasi-knowledge at stake is pretty marvelous, and this leads Pliny to lean first on chance and then on nature. Yet at the same time, I would say the scenario in question merely exaggerates a question that can be raised of any cross-species sympathy or antipathy, namely, how is an animal inserted, to borrow von Uxkill's language, into a network of affinities and hostilities? The stakes of that question become clearer if we consider the simplest example of a relation between non-human natures, namely the relationship between the elements. There's a long history in natural philosophy to making either bare qualities or elements that are allied with qualities the primary level of reality. What defines these qualities in large part, even in monist theories, is their opposition to one another, so hot versus cold, wet versus dry. Now, you don't really need nature to explain how these oppositions come about. Rather, the elements are, from very early on, sufficiently entrenched within a grid of binary oppositions that they don't demand an explanation of their relationships to one another. Although I think it's a testament to the explanatory power of sympathy and antipathy that, in fact, those terms can be applied to the elements in some contexts. But when we shift from the elements to more complex natures, the dynamics of affinity and hostility become more complicated. This is in part because the relations now in question are so varied and so numerous. So the genre of natural history has something of the additive or the paratactic or the expansive to it. But it's also in part because at the level of non-human natures, sympathy and antipathy look like modes of sociality that nevertheless exceed the mental capacities allowed to those animals to say nothing of lesser natures like plants. So let's say that you appeal to the antipathy between, uh, the antipathy between say, chondrion root and snake venom, or the cabbage and the vine. The question immediately presents itself as to why these natures hate one another. If you're not going to allow animals and plants the minds required to negotiate alliances for their own benefit and the avoidance of harm, then you'll have to find another agency that has inscribed them into the network of love and hate. The alternative would be to drill down to the elemental level, and this is precisely the strategy that the atomists will adopt, as I'll show further in my, in my last lecture. And in fact, I think the atomists, and you can see in Lucretius, are responding to the prevalence of sympathy and antipathy as explanatory devices. But to the extent that the sympathies and antipathies of complex natures resist the drilling down of reductionism, they push you up in the other direction. So they push you upwards towards a transcendent organizing principle. And for Pliny, as for Plutarch, as for a number of other authors in the post-classical period, that principle is nature with a capital N. And yet at the same time, the examples of sympathy and antipathy that we've been looking at, where animals navigate a web of love and hate, also complicate the leap upwards to an overarching mind of nature for a simple reason. The examples that we've seen all foreground organisms who are acting to protect or to preserve their own lives. If an author is describing the network of sympathies and antipathies for human ends, it's easy to imagine that network as merely a power grid to be negotiated and controlled. And similarly, if an author is focused on cosmic sympathy, then the sympathies between parts matter for what they ostensibly prove about the integrity of the whole. But the more that sympathy and antipathy are mapped onto the animal's relations with its environment as a source of benefit and harm, 
the more one has to wonder what is the relationship between nature, capital N, as a master transcendent puppeteer, and nature, lowercase n, as the organization of the animal in a certain way so that it can perpetuate its own life. We can see that strain, I think, in Pliny's struggle to say what it is that is actually driving the animal, as well as in Plutarch's model of nature teaching animals. Even the less dramatic cases of animals seeking nourishment ask us to think about how nature works through a nature as internal to it or as imminent within it. So I want to turn now in the last bit of the lecture to two other cases where we can see big N nature encounter little N nature within a conceptual landscape that's organized, whether implicitly or explicitly, in terms of sympathies and antipathies. So I'm going to start with the stoic concept of oikiosis before taking a look at some of the mechanisms of untaught nature and vegetal life in Galen. Now the concept of oikiosis in stoicism is a subject of considerable speculation of debate, and I'm not going to get into that debate here. What I want to do instead is to make a surgical strike to map out the space that oikiosis opens up for an encounter between nature and unnature. And I also want to point out a persistent difference between these two form, or forces. So the theory of oikiosis describes a process whereby an animal, human or non-human, is appropriated or entrusted to itself by nature at the moment of its birth. It's designed to target, then, the point where nature becomes internal to the animal, that is, where cosmic universal mind becomes animal mind, becomes psyche. So modern scholars often describe oikiosis as the animal's affection for itself. But that formulation or that translation, um, I think, occludes a more complex structure that encompasses not only the animal's awareness of itself, but also its desire to preserve itself. So let's take a look at Diogenes Laertes' uh, paraphrasing Chrysippus. This is the locus classicus for oikiosis. So this is handout uh, nine. The Stoics say that the animal's first impulse is to watch out for itself, nature from the beginning entrusting it to itself, as Chrysippus says in the first book of his On Ends. What he says is that the first thing that is proper to an animal, um, the proton oikion, is its own constitution and the awareness of it. For it would not be likely that nature would estrange the animal from itself, or that having put the animal together, she would neither estrange it nor entrust it to itself. We have to say accordingly that nature, having constituted the animal, entrusted it to itself. For in this way, it repels what is harmful and approaches what is suitable. So in short, an animal's first impulse is toward self-preservation because nature entrusts it to itself. We're then given a more precise formulation of the self that's inherent in the reflexive construction. The first thing in life that's proper to the animal is its constitution and its awareness, its sunitesis of that constitution. Now, there are a number of complicated and contested technical ideas in play here, but two points are clear. First, nature's work is not limited to assembling the animal as a set of parts. It extends to creating the animal in such a way that it's oriented towards itself in a favorable way. After all, an animal, unlike a constructed assemblage like a bed or a shoe, needs a way in order to maintain its life dynamically. And so part of the way it does that is by being entrusted to itself. Second, the animal's relationship to itself is closely bound up with its relationship to the world as a source of benefit and danger. What Diogenes describes then is a situation where animals are oriented both inwards towards their own constitution and outwards towards things out in the world that can harm them and help them. The claim that animals have an inward orientation towards their own constitution is one that the Stoics strongly defended. So if you were to just observe animal behavior, you might end up making a different inference than the one that Chrysippus seems to have arrived at in On Ends. So you could, if you were, say, an Epicurean, argue that the animal who seeks out some things and avoids others is just motivated by expectations about pleasure and pain. It's even possible to hold this position and still believe that the animal is a vehicle of its own self-preservation, whether by accident or by design. The claim would be then rather that the animal's actions aren't motivated by the desire to care for its own constitution, but nevertheless arrives at that end. The Stoics very strongly resisted this line of argument. So Seneca points, for example, to the child who diligently tries to learn to walk despite the fact that she keeps falling down. 
He takes this as proof that the child's fidelity is to her own constitution rather than to the pursuit of pleasure. So it's not enough for the Stoics to say that nature made the animal in such a way that it does preserve itself. Rather, they make the stronger claim that the animal acts as it does because it believes that its actions conserve and benefit something that it feels to be its own, namely its own constitution. They insist on what I want to call a fold in the animal, whereby it takes a kind of responsibility for, it takes a kind of care for its own constitution. So the animal's orientation inward holds a central place in the theory of oikiosis. But how does that inward orientation relate to its orientation outwards, that is, the animal's pursuit of beneficial things and its avoidance of harmful things? At first glance, the inward turn seems to give rise to the outward turn. So it's because the animal cares for itself that it responds to stimuli in certain ways. So it eats grass, for example, or it runs from cats. The animal isn't going to get very far if it can't perceive specific dangers and sources of benefit out in the world, that is, its natural sympathies and antipathies. It's precisely the animal's alertness to these specific stimuli that makes the stoic position so provocative. For they deny that the animal acquires the knowledge of what to seek out and what to avoid by experience. Rather, as Seneca writes, at the moment that it emerges from the womb or the egg, the animal is primed to recognize what is harmful and to avoid it. The animal is, we might say, born ready, equipped by nature with an extraordinarily fine-grained sense of how its needs and its vulnerabilities intersect with the world beyond the boundaries of its body. And just how fine-grained this sense can be is very remarkable. So Seneca emphasizes that young chickens are scared of cats and not of dogs. And this is actually a mosaic of a cat attacking a chicken, I was very pleased to find. Um, the second century CE Stoic Heracles offers a veritable menagerie of comparable cases, so um, involving turtles and bulls and asps and bears and toads and deer and beavers. There's an especially great story about beavers that I won't go into here, but if you want to hear about it, ask me afterwards. Um, Cicero's Bulbus, too, furnishes a rich catalog of animal adaptations that are culled from the annals of natural history. And here again, in fact, we meet the leopards who, caught by poisoned meat, have a remedy, as Balbus delicately puts it, to save themselves from death. Now, interestingly, Balbus does not put this in terms of antipathy. But we're clearly on the terrain of what Pliny tells us that at least some Greeks would call sympathy and antipathy. So in all these cases, certain stimuli trigger certain responses in the animal. The animal is nevertheless not just a machine, but an organism modulating its behavior in response to perceptual data in the interest of preserving its own life. So Vonixko might say it's a machine operator. Another way of saying this is that animals are perfectly integrated by nature into a web of sympathies and antipathies without being simple vehicles for a trans-individual nature. This is the beauty of oikiosis, I would say. Through it, nature establishes in the animal an open-ended impulse to preserve the self that arises from the animal's sensing of its own constitution. At the same time, nature establishes the conditions for that impulse to be effectively realized by coding sources of benefit and harm in the environment. So nature and the animal, or nature and lowercase uh, nature, appear seamlessly coordinated in what I've called elsewhere a naturalistic fantasy. And yet, if we look more closely, there is, I would say, a seam of sorts. The animal comes to sense its constitution as its own. Its actions thereby are primarily motivated by the care that it takes for its own life. On the other hand, its perception of objects out in the world is always guided by a kind of knowledge that remains external, namely the knowledge of what is sympathetic to it as a member of its species and what is antipathetic. Here, nature with a capital N continues to govern directly the animal in such a way that it follows species-specific lines of affinity and hostility in the world. And yet, nevertheless, the animal's motivations are mediated by a relationship to itself. Earlier, we saw Plutarch's Grillus defending animal intuitions about benefit as a form of intelligence equal or superior to rationality. On that analysis, nature is the teacher of animals. In the Stoics, animals are decidedly untaught, and that limits the claims that they can make on mind. And nevertheless, as we've just seen, seen, the animal is no automaton. Its care for its own constitution forms what I've been calling a fold 
It's the plant, in fact, in Stoicism that is unmediated, phusis. But might even a plant be enfolded on itself? So I want to turn in these last minutes to Galen, who seems to have struggled over the course of his career with this question of vegetal mind, again, on a terrain that's marked by the vectors of sympathy and antipathy. So Galen, too, is deeply committed to the idea that natures are untaught. He saw this as a Hippocratic inheritance summed up in a famous passage from the 4th century BC um, uh, text, Epidemic 6. So in this text we find the following, nature finds the way for itself, not from thought, dianoia, well trained, readily, and without instruction, nature does what is needed. But whereas for the Hippocratic author, the nature in question is the body reacting to disease, Galen imagines a more expansive definition. In the treatise on the affected parts, for example, he recounts an experiment that he once took with a baby goat. And this is actually in the context of his description of erections. Um, but the baby goat, is, it's not going to be as, as uh, upsetting as <laughs> that, that makes it sound. So Galen takes the goat away from its mother at birth, and he waits a while, and then he offers it a choice of honey, olive oil, wine, or milk. The milk wins out to Galen's great satisfaction. And then he repeats the test when the goat reaches grazing age and then tri triumphantly announces his conclusion. Um, animal natures are untaught, a didactoi. Now, if Galen is triumphant here, it's in part because he saw the question of untaught nature as one that involved high philosophical stakes. These become clear in the text par excellence on what Galen calls, borrowing Stoic terminology, the work of phusis within the body, namely on the natural faculties. So this is Galen's text on what I would call the vegetal body. So when Galen means by natural faculties are the body's faculties of generation, growth, and nourishment. And it's in a discussion of nourishment in the first book that he's sidetracked, as Galen often is, into an extended and polemical discussion about two sects in the uh, natural philosophy. So this is number 10 on your handout. These two sects are distinguished primarily by opposed ontological commitments. So on the one hand, you have a sect that adheres to a continuum theory of matter, and the other to an atomist one. Now these commitments entail others. The corpuscular theorists, Galen alleges, deny that we can assign any special stuff or faculty to nature or to soul. Everything depends for them on small bodies that interact below the threshold of perception. By contrast, the other sect puts nature first and foremost. It's nature who creates plants and animals and endows them with the faculties that they need to survive, always keeping in mind the best outcome for the organism. Now, there's no question at all that Galen's affinities are with the latter group. In this text, he's very keen to show, though, how nature's overall plan is realized through individual organisms and especially through the vegetal stratum of human nature. Now, the core of his explanation is the faculty of attraction by appropriateness of quality, so akiotes poiotetos, and a corresponding faculty of repulsion or expulsion. Now, he's perfectly willing to concede that bodies also obey mechanical principles, including attraction into a void. But he insists that such mechanical principles alone cannot account for the perpetuation of life. Instead, bodies need to be able to perceive and to attract matter that is appropriate to them, and they need to be able to reject matter that is foreign to them. Now, these principles tellingly come into focus against a backdrop of sympathy and antipathy. The figure of sympathy enters the discussion through Galen's claim that Hippocrates pioneered an approach to nature that he himself advocates, a claim that he backs up by quoting from the Hippocratic treatise on nutriment. Now, in Galen's paraphrase, it reads, there is in our bodies, so this is the uh, next one on the handout, there is in our bodies a single breathing together and flowing together, and everything is in sympathy. So for, um, for Galen, the sympathetic unity of the organic body is maintained by its capacity to discern what is appropriate and what is not, a capacity that he seems to understand in terms of sympathy and antipathy. So notably, his paradigmatic case of attraction by quality is the magnet, which was itself the paradigmatic example of sympathy by the second century CE. And there are other contexts where Galen uses the magnet to talk about what he, what he will call explicitly sympathia. Galen also sums up the crime of his atomist opponents, and here he's singling out the Hellenistic physician theorist Asclepiades of Bithynia as a refusal to recognize sympathy. 
So nothing, and, and this passage is interesting because in the one I just showed you, he doesn't actually use the language of sympathy, whereas here in this passage he does. He actually returns to this Hippocratic quote from On Nutriment three times and on the natural faculties and returns to it uh, something like 10 or 12 times throughout his whole corpus that I found. So nothing, as Clopides believes, is naturally in sympathy with anything else, all substances being divided and broken up into inharmonious elements and absurd molecules, that is onkoi is Asclepiades word. For Galen then the workings of attraction and repulsion on the micro level are metonymic of a larger order sympathy that's nothing less than the integrity of nature, capital N. So Galen's nightmare we might say is the fragmented cosmos of the atomists. So one of the reasons that I think Galen is working with largely implicit concepts of sympathy and antipathy is that those concepts enable him to sidestep a difficult um, and puzzling question about the mindfulness of vegetal body. He's quite insistent, in fact, that the faculties don't have mind, they don't have nous, and they don't have reasoning, logismos, and they can't make choices about what is best the way that we do. So at one point he says, the urine does not go to the bladder the way that we go to the market. This is like a Galenic joke. Um, so instead, the natural faculties which trace pre-established lines of sympathy and antipathy become the means by which nature, capital N, works imminently through the vegetal body, much as nature works through stones and drugs. And yet, I think it's precisely because the natural faculties are so mindless on this account that in later writings, Galen will find them inadequate to do all the work that he needs them to do. So one place he runs into trouble is the creative faculty of the sperm that's in, um, on the formation of the fetus. But another lesser known uh, example is, um, is the plant itself. So in one of his last treatises on my own opinions, Galen comes back to the question of what he calls attraction based on quality. There he concludes that it's not possible for an organism to attract what's appropriate without somehow recognizing that it is appropriate and that that kind of recognition requires a perceptual faculty, aesthesis. So Plato in the Timaeus was right. Plants do have sensation. In reaching this conclusion, Galen overturns the entire Aristotelian and Stoic tradition of cutting off plants from animals by denying them perception and sensation, aesthesis. He does so on the grounds that the perpetuation of life is impossible without rudimentary faculties for distinguishing what is appropriate to one's nature. So plants, too, in Galen, have a kind of fold through which nature becomes a nature. They, too, have a mind that is not quite mind. And you might ask, what of the vegetal body? And I have to say that's a question we'll come back to next week. So meditating on the plant in his twilight years, Galen pauses at the level of lowercase nature. In so doing, he seems to shift away from sympathy and antipathy as universal forces in nature, focusing instead on the narrower capacity of perception as internal to the plant. And I wonder if this isn't a clue to the semantic field of sympathy and antipathy, what it encompasses, what it sits in tension with. It may be that these concepts are especially apposite for thinking about the relation itself as a product of something greater than the two natures that it relates. In their trans-individual span, these natures implicate some kind of transcendent mind. So think back again to von Uxkohl in his Contrapuntal Symphony. But it's not just about the relation. The turn to nature as master mind or mastermind is triggered too by perceived limitations in the capacities of non-human natures, including our own non-human nature, to negotiate survival and to participate in a quasi-social community. There's a need for capital in nature to supplement these capacities as a trans-individual principle. And nevertheless, the very mindfulness of non-human natures, their being for themselves, their purposefulness, their capacity for making discriminations in matter, can also focus attention on how nature becomes internal to a nature. And in these contexts, sympathy and antipathy move to the background without, I want to argue, disappearing altogether. They leave traces, and these traces encourage the invocation of capital and nature. So nature is here, on the one hand, a solution to the problem of non-human natures in their complex enmeshment with their environments. And it is, on the other hand, a problem in its own right, given the very integrity and the vital complexity of the organism qua microcosm. <laughs>
We could frame this another way by borrowing the language that I was using last week. So we might say that sympathy and antipathy mark the juncture between two active principles, one working at the macro level and one working at the micro level. Now these principles can be seen as, complement as complementary, and they, they often are, but there will always remain the question of the difference between them. Next week, I'll want to complicate the situation further by considering the doubling of active principles within human nature, where the vegetal body becomes complemented by the rational mind internal to the microcosm. That doubling of active principles will be matched by a doubling of the passive principle. Indeed, we'll see that much of what Sympathea designates at the anthropic level has to do with suffering and the communication and circulation of suffering throughout the organism. In focusing on sympathies within the human, then, we'll have occasion to reconsider the double nature of the organism as mind and body, while continuing to reflect on the nesting of that nature within a larger whole. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a please say more question. Um, it's about the, the term fold, and I'm, I'm guessing that, that Deleuze's use of the, of the, the fold must be involved somewhere in your, in your thinking. And, and um, I realize I'm, I'm not quite sure why you use that term and, and what kind of work you mean it to do. I might have thought that it had to do with the relation between uh, capital N nature and, and small N nature. But, but the way that you use it makes it sound like you know that it's something that's in the, it's in the individual organism. So, so Yeah, I mean. I can't actually say that much more. I mean, it, it's, I think it's informed in part by, by Deleuze, and there's, there's actually a lot of um, Deleuze's reading of Spinoza and ethology here and thinking about, um, I mean, which actually paves the way for thinking about um, von Uxkull without capital N nature, so trying to kind of get the trans, transcendent nature out of the picture. Um, so there's a lot of that in here, but the fold, I mean, in, in, I, I actually mean it in kind of a less, a less invested way, and so maybe for that reason, you know, it does call up notions of Deleuze, but I really just mean it as, you know, as, as a kind of simple way of thinking about, rather than nature just sort of directly coming and being nature and working through, that there's a way in which nature, lowercase n, um, there's a kind of becoming internal to the animal. There's a way in which its, its actions, its motivations become motivated by its relationship to itself, by a form of knowledge, a kind of purposefulness that is always, um, uh, grounded in its sense of, of its own telos. So at that sense, it's really, I mean, a, it's a way of trying to think about how you have an Aristotelian, not a problem, but something opened up by Aristotle's notion of the telos, but Aristotle himself doesn't think about the relationship of natures to other natures and that being a problem. And so really I'm trying to think of, okay, what happens when you relate natures to other natures, but they continue to be kind of folded in on themselves. So it's that, it's that tension that I'm, that I'm thinking about mostly. Um, I, this question might be a question that would end the next week, um, so I can accept that. <laughs> uh, I was really curious about this um, the Hippocratic passage in your mind. Mm -hmm. The one from Epidemic 6. <laughs> this is um, a test about basically involuntary activities of the body. Right. And, and so I, I think there's a sort of analogy here, I guess, with our own bodies doing things that we're not aware of and our perceptions don't motivate them, but they do, you know, we call it you know, so it's self-preservative. Um, and I guess I was curious about whether the, what I think to be an analogy drawn between this, our human body activity and maybe the way, you know, plants and nature work together, whether this is your analogy or, or it's one that he or somebody else drew. You mean the, the expansion of nature in this kind of specific sense here to a larger sense of nature? Yeah, like the mystery that is true of human life as everything else, which is, or one mystery, which is the, the stuff that we pay no attention to, but that preserves us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really, so the, it's Galen doing that work. I mean, Galen is taking Fusus here in a quite narrow sense, and kind of going to town with it. And so he has um, a rich philosophy of nature that's a kind of combination of thinking of nature as demiurgic in the Platonic sense, and he's very interested in the Timaeus, and at the same time, nature is, is teleological. And so he's got this kind of trying to think both transcendent nature and imminent nature. And for him, 
you know, his strategy here is in so many other places is to claim that this is actually Hippocrates all along. So he has this whole kind of, um, this way of embedding larger questions in Hippocratic texts. But at the same time, I think the Hippocratic text is not, it, it's, it's at a point in medical thinking in the Hippocratic corpus where, and I will talk a little bit more about this next week, but not so much, um, where I think you find a kind of um, turning away from pathology and thinking about the sign and the symptom as tied to the pathological event, um, so that health is really just marked by the absence of signs. So that's kind of the semiotics of the body in the earlier text. And as you go along into the fourth century, um, signs tend to more and more reference something in the body that resists disease. Um, and people have noticed that in medical writing you get an increased um, interest in the healthy body from really you know, the end of the fourth century and then into through the fourth century so that health itself becomes a kind of um, target of analysis. And this text is playing a role in that, in that shift um, in, in medical thinking. So I wouldn't want to deny, you know, I think there's, there's obviously, it's obviously a programmatic statement. Um, and so there's both this kind of humbleness to it, you know, I mean, if I'd given you the whole passage, it just goes on about tears and sweat and feces and, you know, <laughs> menses and all of this stuff that are examples of the nature, do, you know, of nature doing its own thing. Um, but at the same time, there is this kind of larger reflection. Um, and Epidemic 6 is from the um, set of texts in Epidemics. It's one of the latest texts we have from the mid, probably the mid fourth century. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, how exactly you're conceptualizing what's going on when you go from the paraphetic vision from Aristotle and Theophrastus, their physics, to the, the Hellenistic ideas that you're interested in. And in particular, uh, some of the things you're saying remind me of the so rethinking what goes on in uh, physics, book 2, chapter 8 of Aristotle, where he is trying to defend the idea of locates and nature against these sort of materialist uh, people. And among the main targets are people like Empedocles, who are actually, they've got big end nature, but because they think everything is sort of a mishmash at the, the much more local level, they can't get lowercase end nature. Whether what you see going on is, you know, the movement away from thinking about the individual nature is just sort of isolated as, you know, self-sustaining physiological systems. So that really can get you to recover the, the capital and nature that Aristotle was Right. Yeah, I mean, so again, I will, I'll come back to this in a couple of weeks, but, but I mean, you know, physics 2.8 is, is an important text for all this because it's a place where you see animals and plants specifically isolated out as a kind of area where there's a transparency to the work of nature because there's no interference, as it were, from, um, from um, plan making rational human nature. And I think that moment, that isolation of the animal and the plant as a kind of point of visibility is, is this, you know, it, it in part opens onto the role that natural history is going to play in larger arguments about nature small n and nature big n and the Stoics and, and so on and so forth. And in fact, um, in On the Nature of the Gods, uh, Balbus at one point says, you know, most of our examples come from Aristotle. So Aristotle is an, is an important point in this tradition. Um, but, you know, in terms of that larger question, um, so it's a, it's a hard question to answer about what, what is big end nature prior to Aristotle? Um, and, you know, is there a notion of big end nature in, in Aristotle? And again, I'm going to take up this question in a couple weeks, but I can say here that, um, you know, okay, part of the problem is we just don't have the text. We just don't know. So we know that Fusus is being used in a, in a programmatic sense. I and mean, it seems that the, the title of the, peri, you know, the inquiry, inquiry peri Fuseos is, is a title that's being used. Um, and both Plato and Aristotle attest to the kind of entrenchment of that tradition. So, you know, we would think that it's about Fusus big N nature, big fee nature, but we don't really, you know, it seems that there wasn't, um, you know, insofar as nature qua mind or nature is somehow operating as, as mastermind is the way I've been describing it, that kind of work of connecting the macro to the micro is just not carried out in someone like Empedocles or someone like an Anaxagoras. You know, it's like they raise the question, um, and if you follow, you know, David Sedley's 
say their lectures, you know, and, and you know, it's not just Empedocles who is this kind of demiurgic, you know, um, love, but also in Exagoras with his noose belongs in that tradition. He tries to flesh out the claim that he might have used noose in that way. But there seems to have been some kind of insufficiency in, in, in working for that, that connection and trying to figure out how mind becomes imminent. And I think what happens with Aristotle, it's like, you, you know, so in Plato you have this kind of demiurgic figure, but then there's not a lot of work done to, to make that principle imminent in, in natures. Um, and Aristotle sort of goes to the lower level, and then the question becomes, how are you going to reconnect the macro to the micro? So how are you going to take the level, the, the notion of the, the organism or the biological and re-macro it, as it were? So that's part of the story that I'm, I want to tell um, in greater detail uh, in a couple weeks. Yeah, I, it's a really great point because, you know, presumably some leopards die or else they wouldn't bother putting the <laughs> aconite out. Right, because there would always be this kind of balance, you know, the leopard would always. So, and yet, for Pliny, what the, I think what's really important is that semper, and the, the semper scare. They always know. They're always aware. And I think you're right that what's the emphasis is on the kind of, the, the um, you know, it's not even a kind of Aristotelian Josepi Topolu. It's really, you know, that the, they can't go wrong because it's programmed into them. And I think in the Stoic, in the Stoic idea of oikiosis too, one of the things that's really fascinating to me is the perfect insertion of the animal, as it were, into its environment, which involves a kind of, you never misfire. You never misfire in your identification of benefits and harms. And of course, that notion of never misfiring, of kind of perfect attunement, is de being developed against the foil of humans. Because the, you know, from the beginning of the, the philosophical ethical tradition, there's really this question, why is it that we go so wrong um, in identifying our good? And, and as you get into the, um, the, the Hellenistic tradition that gets more and more framed in terms of naturalism so that you know we have that our goal is to get back to our natures and yet what how does this open up this gap between our nature and our fulfillment of that nature um, but um, you know and so the animal functions in a rhetorical way against that and I think for plenty that's that's what's going on here but but even independent of that tradition um, you know you can see the animal functioning um, well, I would guess I would say it's another branch of that tradition, the way that human techne also is figured in terms of success or failure or misfire against a notion of the animal always getting it right. So if you look at, say, um, the Hippocratic text on ancient medicine, there you have the idea that animal fuses are, are perfectly inserted into their environment. They never get things wrong. Their food is perfectly adapted to them. Whereas it's humans who, uh, by na their own natures, are sort of imperfectly inserted into the environment, and therefore they, they, they suffer until they discover a way to cook food and therefore, you know, self-consciously tame nature, um, as it were. So, so um, I don't know of any examples of the animal failing because, as it were, its rhetorical function precludes that <laughs> being, <laughs> being a, a story you tell. But if I find one, I'll let you know because it's an interesting question. Right. Well, I think I would, I mean, I don't know if I would answer the question in terms of the disjunct between the traditions. I think that what's, so what's interesting is that the complexity that you describe, I think, is enfolded into the, the both the Greek and the Latin. I mean, one of, you know, Nicola Rowe has this great line that the, the uncanny in Greek should be translated by philos, not ethros, you know. The, the, the uncanny is that which is most close to you. And so, you know, this kind of way in which the thing that's um, oikeos is somehow also, you know, hostile is, is, is embedded in there. And in fact, I mean, it's interesting that you focus on this because I had a hard time naming this lecture uh, because no one, Term, terms didn't seem to capture the, the extent of the opposition. So I went with affinity and hostility because I think that um, the kind of boring answer to your question is if you look at Pliny, he clearly sees these as polar opposites. So friendship and hatred and war and peace and discordia and concordia. So he uses sympathia and antipathia in the passage that I gave you that are just transliterated in book 20. But if you look at book 24, he translates them into concordia and discordia. Now, it's an interesting thing that um, sympathia is translated by a lot of different terms in Latin, sometimes consensus, sometimes contagia sometimes cognatio, sometimes concordia. I mean, it's really, it shows you how much is built into that Greek term and how many different ways you can go. So the question of the difference between the two, I think Latin authors are sort of more 
their attempt to sort of transport the semantic field into sympathy splinters in, in terms of the language that they use. But, it, but that doesn't go to the question that you're pointing to, which is this kind of way in which the hostility, that, that the polar opposition that I think is structuring this relationship in Pliny and I think is incredibly embedded in this notion of benefit and harm. Um, that things are beneficial, things are harmful to you. I really do think that that polarity is there. Um, but beyond that layer, there are all these complications. Um, another example I would give, which I think is, is a provocative one, is oikeos. So what is oikeos? It's something that you could form an, a relationship of a compact with. And so the, the symbiotic relationship that you see in the pinna and the pinna guard. But what's a chaos is also, you know, in questions of nutriment, it's something that you can make into yourself. And so the thing that might be, you know, oikeon might be prey. So the predator will only eat the prey that is kin and can be assimilated and that the body can take in. And, and it was funny, I actually, I almost put this cartoon in that was, that I found, I can't remember what I was looking for, but, um, and I can't, you know, I can't remember the punchline now, but it's like a little fish and a shark and, the shark is, or the fish is saying, like, I don't know what kind of relationship you want to, you know, symbiotic relationship you want to enter into. <laughs> and, and it goes precisely to the fact that symbiosis, as it gets translated into the bio, you know, uh, the kind of modern way of thinking about symbiosis, also contains this kind of ambiguity about that there's a way in which you can have a, a relationship of affinity where you cooperate against prey, and you can have that describe the relationship between predator and prey. So that's another place that I think there's an internal sense of, of of hostility even within um, uh, affinity. But again, I don't think, uh, I don't, I would suspect that you're right that it maybe maps differently onto the Roman, like how the Romans would translate oikeos and allotrios, but I think that the doubleness is in both traditions. So I wanted to ask you a question about, about the goat's blood and the, and the diamond. <laughs> Um, sort of Don't try it at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sort of by way of, of von Wexkel, right? Because I mean, I mean, one of the amazing things about, I mean, von Wexkel is, I mean, it's one of the sort of great sort of discourses of estrangement, right? I mean, what it what it does is to kind of make one aware that you know the kind of another the the sort of organismic is not actually you know, that there are other ways in which one's body or the constituents of one's body are kind of <coughs> active, right, in one's life world than at the level of kind of the organismic right. whole, right? And so you, you know, you, you, were, talk, you were talking about, you know, in, in Seneca about, you know, the, the, the organism's commitment to realizing um, its constitution, right. right, as kind of what, bridges, um, sort of bridges between sort of estrangement and, and entrusting, right? But the, the example, I mean, the example of the goat's blood and the diamond, right, insofar as that is a kind of um, a relationship of, you know, that, that's kind of sub-organismic, right, would seem to kind of lie, you know, sort of cut or, or not allow for that kind of that way in which the, the sort of organism is being sort of saved through the idea of constitution, right, as, as the kind of, you know, the thing that bridges between estrangement and... and what do you mean by, by bridging? Because well, I'm not the, quite sure I get the, that. The, 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 sort of the commitment to the constitution, right, right is what saves the organism... For I the, see. For the, as the kind of location of, 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 of sort of identity, let's right, say. Right, 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 right. Right, whereas the kind of solid... Right, right, because if you didn't have that inbuilt into the organism, then the organism would be, as it were, it would be a estranged yeah. from itself. Yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, I yeah. see what you're saying. Yeah, um, but in the example of, of the... I can't remember if it's affinity or, or hostility between right. the goat's blood and the diamond. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a, a kind of purely mineral... Right, you right. Know, the, the sub organismic. And so, I mean, I wonder how many other examples like that there are that, that seem to be yeah. op operative in a way that can't be then saved by the organ, you know, by yeah. positing the organism's commitment to realizing its own constitution. Yeah. Um, so, 
I mean, I would see it a little bit differently. Like, I guess one of the reasons that I start in Pliny with these cases of the animals who are sort of conscious of their own, uh, you know, insertion into sympathies and antipathies, but also this triangulation, is that it magnifies this question of what would it mean for an animal to know sympathies and antipathies out in the world. But in mm -hmm. fact, that question is there from the beginning. And that you're right that there are cases where there's too much strain on the notion of the lowercase nature for that even to kind of come into to being. Um, and so the question is, how far can you push that? And in the case of the um, animal, like what, what I wanted to show is that in fact, in Pliny, animals can operate on that continuum. So if bees are sort of pushed away from the olive tree, they act like in that sub, you know, organismic level. Like they're, they're basically just automata. Uh -huh. And there's an action reaction sort of um, work going. There's no fold at that yeah, level. It's yeah, merely, they're just merely right. vehicles of nature. So right. from that sense, there's, it's almost as if there's no estrangement because there's no self. Okay. There's no constitution, there's no reflexivity. Yeah. But at the level of the animal in Pliny, there's also a way in which there's this, this problem of because the animal is operating for its own benefit and harm, this question of the fold opens up. Uh -huh. In Galen, I think that the, he backs it up so that plants now can participate in that question of the fold. But I don't know of any cases where stones can actually be saved by that, that question. Yeah. And so that's why I think, you know, there's this way in which sympathy and antipathy are capacious terms that because they, they can account for diamonds and, and goat's blood and, and you know, all of these types of things, and even in Galen, this notion of, say, certain drugs that work sympathetically. You know? So yeah. like sympathy and antipathy become a way of just nature top-down orchestrating the entire world, the entire network. And as you have this kind of fold opening up, I think you, st you start to see a kind of insufficiency or problem with sympathy and antipathy as explanatory principles because they're, they're as it were, too explanatory if that makes yeah, sense. So I think yeah. when Galen says, you know, in On Natural Faculties, like he's, I'm fairly convinced he's using sympathy and antipathy in this very kind of broad sense in order to account for the non-mindfulness of the natural faculties. So there's no fold, as it were. Yeah. Like there's an attraction of quality, and that's just a quality that inheres in the natural world, in the material world, because there is nature, capital N. But okay. when he comes back, I mean, next week I'll talk about, okay, so what he has real problems with what happens to the vegetal body when you actually take sympathy and antipathy away as the prime, you know, this, the point at which they're not sufficient. And that point when he comes to the plant and says the plant has to have isthesis is the point at which you are raised up from the sub-organismic to the organ. So the claim, I mean, that I started to make at the end of the lecture is that it's when sympathy and antipathy operate in this sub-organismic way that the push upwards to nature, capital N, is most felt. Okay. And when you right. start to get the fold, they start to become, as it were, too insufficient yeah. as explanatory principles. They're too broad. Right. Um, but that's, that's kind of my hunch. Right, okay. And, and but they're still there. They're yeah. still haunting the relationships, yeah, yeah. but they... But it's not necessarily a problem if, you know, the blood inside me is kind of active as a, a sort of locus of sympathy and antipathy. Right, you could have a kind of... On its own behalf, right? Yeah. I mean, because that's what's so disturbing about the, the butyric acid, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just in the way that, that von Wexel presents it, right? I mean, it, it's, it's somehow sort of operative within... Us, right, right, right. In, a, in a way that kind of disturbs our sense of our kind of, you know, sort of organismic commitments. Although right, there, I think that the butyric acid is functioning. I mean, it's like you're being interpolated by the tick as an as a kind of mammal. You know, I mean, there's a there's actually I would actually say there's a kind of integrity of the of the nature, okay. of the human. You know, at that in okay. that encounter, okay. um, yeah. that is a little bit different from when you have this idea that your blood might operate in relationships of sympathy and antipathy kind of on its own. Right. I think it's, yeah, I think that it's really, you know, it becomes a point where you say there's no way of, of integrating a kind of mental capacity to negotiate alliances or to discern benefit and harm within the lowercase nature, that you need to have a trans-individual principle that can account for the whether it's the insertion of animals into their environment or whether it's the behavior of these things which are clearly without mind that nevertheless operate on nature in non-mechanistic qualitative ways. Yeah, I guess what I would wanna say is that there's at the lowest level, 
um, of, let's say, goat's blood and diamonds. The push up to nature is sort of most, most, um, this is just simple, um, that you kind of need to push upwards. And at the level of the leopard where you see, you see plenty sort of struggling, like is it, is nature become, I mean, nature's still involved, but is it now nature that's imminent in unnature, you know? And so this question of whether, I mean, it's interesting, it might seem strange to equate nature and chance, but throughout the Materia Medica, Pliny is talking about how things that look like chance are really a providential nature putting a remedy in place for humans often. So you'll have lots of descriptions of kind of, you know, chance discoveries of some remedy, and of course it can't just be chance, it's this, it's this God. So the conflation he makes here between um, nature and chance is, is repeated elsewhere. But in that case, it's as if nature is this trans-individual process who sort of just orchestrates the encounter as opposed to a way uh, where a place in which nature becomes the nature of of the of the leopard and so at that place I would say there's a kind of there's a there's a hesitancy there's this disjunction that Pliny tries to paper over by saying there's not really a big difference whether you say it's outside whether you say it's inside it's all the same thing and I'm saying well actually it's not all the same thing it's like how you you know do you recognize the kind of fold of nature and if you do what does that mean for thinking about larger nature and, and animals as somehow having a kind of active principle of their own as distinct from this just machine I mean you know nature play machine operator as opposed to a model where um, you just, animals are vehicles or plants are vehicles for, for sympathies and antipathies. So what I was trying to argue is that in the cases where you have animals seeking their own benefit and harm or participating in these sympathies and antipathies in this triangulated way, the tension between big end nature and lower end nature is felt as a kind of trace in, in the authors about a question of how is it that you can have an animal working on its own, not just being a vehicle of nature, uh, you know, in, in, and nevertheless having this large relationship to nature. Other questions? All right, let's thank her once again.